so what I see with this particular church, which is so impressive, is they're investing in the things that the congregation are witnessing close up. Mm. You know, so it's like the, um, you know, the treasure binding of the gospel. They've got the icons, obviously, and the chalice you know, and then they got the candelabras and pretty much that's it. Or, you know, they're probably going to be flowers and their icons are just on a couple of easels, but they've mm. draped them in some beautiful fabric. And I, and again, I just love that because it's economy and it's focus and it's really putting the resources where they should be and kind of traveling around in England and going to churches in other denominations. What I see is just, you know, in some ways they have more resources, but there isn't the same focus, you know, it might all be fundraising for the, the vestry roof or something, which I, I know these practical problems exist and we need to we need to address them. But also it's like, but where is the priority? And, you know, it's I really wanted to, if anyone's listening, appeal to people, please engage artists and designers in your church because design is happening, whether you like it or not, you know. I think you've talked about this, Jonathan, but you can't avoid design. It's going to work on your congregation anyway. So use it consciously. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. Hello, everyone. I am very happy to be here with Heather Pollington. If you've been following me for a while. You've heard me drop her name a few times. Um, Heather is a designer. She has worked on several projects, very large movies that you've heard about. And we've been collaborating now for several months. She redid my whole branding. You can see the great new Symbolic World logo, the, the Symbolic World website, uh, you know, just beautiful work that that she has produced for me. But I thought it would be really interesting to discuss with her and look at her process, how she comes to her ideas, to her designs, how she takes a, a movie story and is able to create images and designs and sets based on that. So, Heather, it's really great to have you with me today. Hi, thanks for inviting me. And so my first question to you is, how does one end up doing the things you're doing? Because it's very particular. It is very particular. Um so I studied similar time to you at art school as a fine artist. Um, and I think pretty quickly I realized that the sort of contemporary fine art world wasn't really for me. And I was interested in filmmaking process particularly. And it, I was lucky because at that time um, in Britain, the film world was kind of exploding because of the Harry Potter movies. And I was lucky enough to get my kind of entry level role on the Harry Potter series. And that's where I learned the craft really with some of the best people in the world working at that time. And um, the sets were very detailed. Um, and that's really where I started out. And um, today I'm just gonna take you through some of the, the films I've worked on um, and kind of how we go about designing for films. Um, throughout the last 20 years, it's been, my role has been a sort of graphic artist, graphic designer, which means within the film art department, I'm responsible for um, anything that has like a graphic design, illustrative element. It could be like a, a it might be a book. It might be branding within a film, you know, like um, sort of branding for a Bond villains company. It could be a um, monogram for a medieval king, for example. So it's really varied. It depends what film you're on, different periods, and you really have to learn the language of that film right at the offset and then you can start creating things in that language and the languages are quite complex which you'll see because from the outset people think you know it's a medieval film but but really that could mean hundreds of different things so you're taking your cues from the director about what do we mean what is the world we're creating and it's always driven by the story um, and the story we're trying to tell and we're setting it within that within that kind of term so we'll We'll go through. Um, but first, I want to say that before I show you things, when I discovered your channel, like so much of what you talked about resonated with me because there's a lot of similarities to the way that we work in film. I mean, we sort of work in, in the symbolic world generally. Um, and also it's it's 
a world of visual hierarchies. And so a lot of the stuff you talked about with hierarchy really kind of chimed. And I'm I'm gonna kind of look at it through that lens because I thought it'd be interesting for your for your yeah, because like you said, in some ways the, the idea of making a medieval film, it's not just about making something medieval, it's to make it medieval within the purpose of the story itself. And so the sets and the images have to supplement or you know help the story. It's not just about showing a medieval castle, right? Or showing some medieval tapestry or whatever. Well, well, exactly. So, you know, what is the medieval world? It can be a hundred different things. So we have to decide what it is that we're saying. Um, and, and I'm going to also talk about the, the difference between history and story. Um, what you'll find if you go on IMDb, IMDb, you'll have a lot of experts saying, you know, this is historically inaccurate, um, which in some cases is true and mistakes get made. But quite often people will purposefully break with history in order to prioritize story. So we're mm -hmm. going to have a look at that as well. Um, so I'll just, should I just share my screen? Yep. This is a diagram of the, the sort of hierarchy of props on the film set. And I've noticed, I've listened to a lot of discussions that you've had about perception and how we sort of experience the world and how, um, you know, people that we know or things we care about will appear to us in detail. Um, and things that we maybe aren't aware of, even though they're in front of us, we, we don't really see them. And actually that idea is formalized in the filmmaking process. So if you go onto a film set, we have a way of categorizing props. So mm -hmm. hero prop would be, it's held by the actor. It has a specific purpose to tell a story. Um, it's likely to be in close up. It, it might be in close up with the actor or it could even be an insert shot where literally your prop is the whole screen of the movie. And that that hero prop will contain um, lots, lots of detail for the story. It might be a moment where you suddenly, you know, something is revealed in this image or this prop. So it's very important. A lot of time and energy is spent into getting those things right directors really care about them because obviously if they don't work then the, the you know the audience doesn't understand what's going on um and technically a hero prop will um it's normally made for real so if we're making like a medieval book it will be made properly in leather with proper um you know metal work the interior will be parchment it might be hand painted we will use real gold leaf mm -hmm. that sort of thing that that level of detail and then as you go down this hierarchy to the to what's dressing, then background and then deep background, that process kind to an extent deteriorates. So if you're looking at deep background props that may be four meters from the camera, really, you, it's probably not going to be the real thing. It's going to be something that looks looks like the real thing. You know, we're going to spend a little bit less attention, a little bit, a little bit less time on that thing. Um, so this is all very important because when 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 you have film budgets you really have to put that money into the right things that you're getting value from on screen um, Yeah, you can see how it's a contraction of our experience because like you said the problem is that you have a limited amount of resources obviously you don't have infinite resources and yeah. just that very fact and the fact that you have to you have to create attention with a limited amount of resources therefore they'll a, a hierarchy will immediately get set up because yes. you you have to decide what's more important and what's less important and that will have to do with attention in terms of of a movie for sure absolutely because we have very tight deadlines so we have to decide you know where we're going to put our energy um and what's going to be seen on screen and and um you know how are the audience going to read what we're doing so that's all really inbuilt to our process and, and it's um, interesting because when you see actually when you think of movies where the uh, resources became near infinite. Um, then all of a sudden, everything becomes flat. It, There's it, a certain yeah. flatness to those, those those movies and those stories. I'm thinking of of how after Lord of the Rings, which was so amazing, Peter Jackson just got like infinite amount of resources to make King Kong, and then you just you're just like your eyes are straining to watch King Kong fight one more dinosaur and, and just like millions of details that won't stop, you know, as yeah. if the yeah. very it's limited so, resources forces a, a proper hierarchy. It, it's so interesting you say that because it, it is a problem and it's something we're going to kind of find out as we go through this. Um, so I would say, yeah, in the last 10 years, there's there's sort of been a diminishment of hierarchy in film. 
uh, two things, as you say, unlimited budgets almost, and you know, obviously CG, which which is it's kind of limitless, and um, and and in a way, it's it's compromised the craft. Um, and if you look, watch older films, you know that are more limited technically, you'll see you'll see m- more just better storytelling. Um, you know, it's it's difficult to describe, but. But it, ha- but it has to do with and, hierarchy, definitely, because it's not yeah. just what ends up happening is not just even in what you're doing. It's not just hierarchy of of objects, but it ends up being a kind of hierarchy of motion and a hierarchy of of action. Right. You know, in a, in an older movie, your action scene cost you so much to make and was so demanding that you had to really make it dramatically relevant and dramatically constructed. And now it's like you just watch CGI characters fight for 15 minutes. And it's so boring because yes. there's no stakes, right? There's no yeah, stakes there's in the no people stakes. who made it. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's like the the crew aren't invested, and then as a viewer, neither are you. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so I'm just going to go through these images. So this is um. I, it seems like stating the obvious, but I I want to do that just in case people aren't aware that most of the films I work on they really do start like this. It's a basically a warehouse, and then and then we build um everything so you're going to build the walls and then you're going to get the interior decoration and then every single prop is going to be brought into that space um this is the bond stage at pine which which i've done a few sets and i worked for an amazing designer called dennis gasner and he he was kind of my mentor early on in my career and he said you know the story has to be in every single thing that we do so when we stood there we're you know, we're bringing all these things in and we we have to decide, like, you know, if there's three different knives or three different logos, we have to decide which one it is. And so so our point is wh- which one is best for the story. And, and that applies to everything, you know, even like down to the paper choice that I make. So in that case, if, if I was doing like an MI6 office for James Bond, you know, we, even though you're not going to see it, we would still think about the paper that they that they have in that office you know mm. that would be a choice and, and and it's easier to have those limitations because like you say otherwise it's just a million choices um so so we have that as our as our kind of guiding rule um i just want to say as well that all of these images I'm, i produce them in a team so there's lots of people um that i've worked with over the years and um especially my my job share partner kathy who's been part of this process. So I just want to mention them because there's too many to name as I go through. Um, so this is um, this is where I started out. This is Harry Potter. As you can see in these two images from the film, um, there's a lot of documents and a lot of books. And I started off really doing very background props. And what you need in that case is a lot of quantity and a lot of texture. So as I was explaining before, um, how we deal with props in terms of a hierarchy, you can see on the image in the right where Harry is sat. Here you have real books. Um, and then here, which is a few meters away from the camera, these are fake. And, and I spent about six months of my career at the beginning just making these books. <laughs> and you can't open them. So... Um, but again, they totally served the purpose. We had to fill the whole library with hundreds of books. So um, you start off doing that when you're when you're at the bottom. And then in about 2007, I got a lucky break um, and went out to Budapest to work for Guillermo del Toro and Hellboy 2. And at that point, I was running the department and de- then I'm responsible for all, all the graphic props. So... Um, the you know everything from the hero things like these where you've got maps storytelling maps um and then you know also I'm doing background things but the but the background things do have a lot of detail so for example this is like this was the um the map room in in this kind of underground realm called the troll market and we had to develop a language for that world and then all of these little tags that you see they have the troll language stamped on them um, and all of these maps um, me and my assistant Alex we drew all of those maps they're just hanging in the background but they're all our own work so you can see just the amount of detail that goes in um, and people 
you know, people think, well, why would you do that? Why, why not just go and get any old map? Um, but in this case, you know, if you're in a fantasy world, you can't, you can't get anything from the real world. So you've got, you've got really got to make it. Yeah. Um, and it's so funny that, you know, for people, the people watching, you know, when Heather contacted me and she said that she had made these props on Hellboy 2, I specifically remember watching Hellboy 2 and, and being, and, and, realizing the difference between Hellboy 2 and a lot of the other movies that I'd seen in terms of the attention to detail. And also at the time I was already interested in medieval uh, like aesthetics and more ancient aesthetics. And I thought like, well, they got this right. Like they got so many things right in terms of, in terms of that. So, so, uh, so I have to say, I want to tell everybody, I mean, if you haven't seen Hellboy 2, just visually, just for the visuals, it is, it is worth watching. It's pretty astounding. Um, so I, yeah, what, this is one of the hero props from Hellboy 2 and this, you know, pretty much, you know, early in my career being given this was pretty amazing because um, it's right in the first scene and Professor Broom has this book and it basically introduces the whole world of the Golden Army and they use it as a portal for an animation. So it's in close up. So th this is one of the examples. This is my visual, uh, which I just drew in a computer on the left. Um, but then it did, you know, get made uh, by some bookbinders in Budapest and leather and everything. Um, and I think it was interesting because I knew we were sort of in the medieval world, but you can tell by looking at it, you know, the colours are pretty lurid. Uh, it's definitely in the world of fantasy. It's got a robot in the middle. Um, but it's it's something, some really valuable thing that I learned from Guillermo is about kind of style and colour. You know, one thing he said was Hellboy is red and therefore everything in the movie is pretty much green and, and blue mm. um, because you always want Hellboy to be the focus. So, again, just to explain that what I do is never like about an individual object or me. It's always complementary. It's always part of the, the drama that we're creating. And so you have to have all those considerations in place when you're designing stuff. Mm. Um. But there's such a there's such a sensibility. Go back to the the one before. Like this, yeah. if you look at the little tree that you designed there on the left, the the little kind of uh, symbolic tree there. I mean, it has it really has it has a, a an understanding of how to make a symbolic tree, but it doesn't look like any other one that I've seen before. And so that's why it it really works in terms of a fantasy movie that's also related. You know, it's like it's related to to our history because it, it it's as if there's a secret history kind of going through our normal history. And that's what it feels like when you see it. It's like, oh, that's a obviously that's like a tree that I could see in an old design or like Islamic art. I'm not sure, but it it looks like that, but it's not quite that. It's interesting you you picked up on that because I, I actually didn't draw that tree. So I, oh. I got that from Guillermo. <laughs> Um, I think it was it was a it was a piece from the concept art that I had to integrate. So that can happen quite a lot. Again, this this process is massively collaborative, mm. um, and you know there's a lot of people involved. So sometimes you'll get given something. So I, that was the only thing I got, and then I developed the book around it. But, but like you say, there was already a good language in there that I could use and kind of extend out. Mm. Um, but you can see there the lettering around the outside. That's like a, a kind of bespoke alphabet that we developed in our department. Mm. Um, so, so these are um, yeah some of the other bits and bobs from Hellboy Two that I did. Um, you can see there's quite a few here. There's a lot of hero props in that in that film. Mm. Um, this one, you know, it's just an incidental hotel sign um, where this creature kind of rips off the O. So it can be something as boring as that that you have to design. Um, here you can see Hellboy stood in front of a, it's, it was supposed to be under Brooklyn Bridge and we built the whole thing in Budapest mm. um, and we had to do all the storefronts. So again, you're kind of, you're trying to um, reference like contemporary New York, but at the same time, you know, you're in the comic book world. So everything is like exaggerated, oversized. I did this, you, I don't know if you can see it, I did like Daddy O's Garage because we were referencing like sort of 50s comic book Americana. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's really a world of its own and you have to um, really get into that and, and and think, you know, beyond the script really. Yeah. Um, so after that I did, 
um, a couple of the Bond films. And, and these are these are kind of interesting because um, you might look at this image and think, you know, it's pretty boring, but it's actually one of the most interesting films. And the reason is um, we're working with Sam Mendes, he was he was telling a story about London in 2012 MI6 got blown up and the, the MI6 team went into a bunker. So what he's doing there is he's tapping into something for the, the kind of at least the British audience, you know, about the Second World War. Um, it's it's the narrative of kind of, you know, Bond being out of date, you know. So when I talked to him about what does this office look like, he wanted me to produce this file here. And, and it's purposefully very kind of old fashioned. It's almost 1990s. You know, we're in 2012. The likelihood is things would be digital. But mm. again, you would select in terms of story that you would go towards the old fashioned, towards the manual in order to create a certain narrative about the world that bonds in. Um, and what I'm seeing at the moment in film, and I don't know about you, Jonathan, but particularly in medieval films, there's just constant innovation. Um, people always want to do something new visually. And the problem is sometimes we need to be conservative in design. Yeah. Um, now, in the case of Skyfall, he is in London and you see you see the world that he's in, in MI6. And then he travels to Shanghai. Yeah. And this is a, a an animated jellyfish that he encounters and there's a fight scene. So compared to the world we've come from, this world is very technologically advanced. It's alienating. It's strange. You've got this blue light. And so what Sam's doing is he's got these two contrasts. Um, but what I'm seeing is when, when people want to inject kind of strange elements everywhere, that's kind of falling away. Mm. So I, I'll give you an example. If you saw um, if you saw the, the Green Knight film. Yeah. So that film, there was a lot that I admired about the design. I thought it was really interesting. But after I'd finished watching it, I was like, there's something about that film that I can't figure out that didn't didn't quite work for me. And I was reading Gawain and the Green Knight with my daughter. And it was just like an old 70s book with watercolours. Mm -hmm. And it started off saying, um, you know, the opening thing was like, we're in Camelot, you know, every, everyone sat around the fire. Okay, you're in the home state. And mm. then suddenly, like, this this green knight comes in on horseback, which is completely strange, right? And so there, there, there's a dramatic impact there because you have a conservative setting that is home, and then the strangest comes into that. Yeah. But the problem with that film is that the setting of the round table was it's already strange. alien. Yeah, it's, it's already, already strange. It was like it was like medievalism meets Star Wars, if you know yeah. what I mean. There was a globalist element to it. Yeah. So as we went in, I was like, wow, some you know these visuals are stunning. But when the Green Knight came in, it just felt like more of the same. Mm. So I, I feel like it's something that that is there, and I just wanted to sh to show when it's done well, it really does work in terms of story. Yeah. And and this is something that I when I talk to people who go to films, they don't necessarily they can't really articulate what the problem is, but they know if something just didn't quite work, or they they're just like, oh, you know, I didn't really get the story or whatever. So yeah, it just it just didn't land. You ask the person, you know, if why didn't you like it or did you like it? And they don't know why, they just know that they usually, yeah, they usually just say, Well, you know, yeah, yeah. it was just it wasn't that great or whatever. But but I'm seeing more and more now, I'm aware of this thing. It's one of the reasons why that people people need to be restrained sometimes, I think, mm -hmm. um, in terms of how much they're innovating. Yeah. And I, when I when I see the two images you showed, the one the one of MI6 in the bunker, then I realize that using arches, you know, because you wouldn't have you wouldn't have had to use arches, but using arches and and brick and, you know, kind of that 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 aesthetic is perfect for the contrast with with this kind of high tech world. Yeah, and it does. It not only does it look like a bunker, but it looks it looks old. Like it looks like a like an old basement from a, a you know a seventeenth century building or something. Yeah, and it, it it's built. You know, again, that's not a location. That was all done purposefully. It's it was really clever. Yeah. Um. So I'm, I've just kind of made this point about the primacy of story over reality, and I just wanted to share um this example with you. 
And uh, a lady that does the same job as me called Annie Atkins, she's got a great Instagram and she pulled up this um, example um, and it's it, it refers to Titanic. So when Rose arrives in New York on a lifeboat, she looks out at a green Statue of Liberty. In 1912, the statue would have not been fully oxidized and should have been a copper color. And, mm-hmm. she, and, she, and she shows the um, this postcard from 1912 of a, yeah. of a copper Statue of Liberty. So, so if the director showed a copper Statue of Liberty, the the audience would would go, "Why is that brown?" Yeah, because their frame of reference is that it's green. Whereas if it's green, what the audience feels is home, mm. you know, or, or America, or what you know, whatever it is. So that that's what we want. We're always going for the emotion with the audience, and you know, small historical details like that, although it will annoy people. It's it's less important when you're making a film. Yeah, um, it's a great example to help you understand, like you said, the primacy of story. And you know, people will get annoyed maybe with me, but I think that's something that happens in traditional stories all the time, and even possibly in the Bible story. That is, especially with time, certain details get get contracted in a manner to make sure that they that they communicate to the largest amount of people what has to be communicated and yeah. so that the, there's a there's a need to because if it if that doesn't happen then idiosyncrasy is idiosyncrasy and you you know you you don't have the same level of it the same kind of attention to something strange and idiosyncratic than you do to something like you said that feels familiar and so the example of the statue is a great one to help people understand. Yeah, it's really good. And you, and you're absolutely right. So um, we're going to get on to some medieval things in a minute. But um, what I would say is, you know, say say you're doing a medieval film, you can only really use examples that are going to be within within the experience of your audience. Because if if you pull something up from the 13th century that is no longer recognized, it's not going to work. Like no one knows what that is. And like you say, it's jarring because they're like, well, you know, what's that thing in the background? So yeah, so unless that's what you want to do, unless you want to create a uh, otherworldly, an otherworldly effect. Like that's what I, I keep thinking about. Like if I made a film in the middle ages, I would, I would write it and I would make it in a way that would make the, the, the middle ages look like almost like a, how can I say this? Like a paradise, right? Which would be surprising to people because they're used to make to making it look like dirty, disgusting, you know, a uh, place. And so it's like that that surprise would be used in the story. It's like why why is everything so like gold and colorful and and you know so that but you would have to put it in the story. If it's just background, it's not worth it. It's not worth the effort. Definitely not. I mean, we've talked about that, haven't we? The the kind of the recent trend for making everything in the medieval world kind of brown and. But I've I've kind of pondered on why that is, and this is my hunch about it. I think it's to do with, you know, the Western world's slight um, discomfort with its past, and particularly its Christian past. Because what I've seen on set is if there's something like a prop that people aren't that pleased with, they'll get a prop guy to come and, and spray brown over it. It's how ha- I've seen it happen loads of times. They go, mm. oh, I'll just dirty that down, because they just want it to kind of... The fade you know, into the background. Fade into the background, exactly. And what you see now in in medieval films is that that's happening on mass. That the whole thing has gone brown. And it's like, you know, if you look at like heraldic language, for example, is so brightly coloured and powerful. You know, and that's how it would have been in the medieval world. I'm talking now about historical accuracy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, but the effect, like, it would be interesting because the effect of walking into Saint Chapelle. I was there, you know, in Paris. This. Uh, a few weeks ago with my kids and they had never been, you know, they'd never seen it. And I was like getting them all, I was getting ready to watch their eyes when they would walk into the church and just see the red and the blue and the gold and just, you know, all the, it's just so, it's just so overwhelming. And so, you know, it's interesting. It, it'd be interesting to think of that dramatically in terms of, uh, in terms of storytelling, like how, how could we change people's perception of the middle ages in the story by creating that same, if a surprise that you have when you walk into oh definitely you know, I've I've thought about that many times <laughs> um okay I'm gonna carry on yeah so th- this would this is like a hero prop for Mary Poppins so this is just an example from my work of the amount of things that you might have to think about if you're creating something like this so story is here 
um, the Banks family have a certificate. Um, and even though Mary Poppins Returns is set in the 1930s, the certificate dates back to the 1910, 1910 even. And so I had to create this. So basically looking at um, design of certificates and then you have to go into the whole history of the banking industry. Where would it have been based? When would it have been established? What was the currency at the time? figuring out the address and all the details, signatories, things like that, as well as looking at the typography. So even though it's just a bit of ephemera in a film, yeah. again, if it's wrong, you're aware that people are going to kind of, you know, screen grab it on the internet and then go on IMDb and tell you where you're wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this is this was the world of um, Mary Poppins um, returns that I worked on. And I put this in because, again, it's, it's not just about um, worlds that you create. In this case, it's definitely about memory. It's like you're dealing with a very iconic character that is very precious to lots of people. Uh, so when you come onto a film like this, it's not like, oh, you know, amazing creative opportunities, although they may come. It's more, I have a huge responsibility to kind of preserve um, this, this world. And, you know, so that the people who love it, you know, don't get disappointed. So. Um, we're looking at 1930s London here, but it's all definitely through the lens of the, the world of Mary Poppins. So you can see, um, you know, lot, lots of pastel colours. It's 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 um, it's it's pretty light, you know, uh, they, these I had to re replicate these um, blocks, these iconic blocks from mm -hmm. the first movie. Um, and then this in that film was the world of the villain, which was in the bank. So it was like bank signage, carpets, um, account ledger. And there's the certificate there kind of set within the Mary Poppins kite. And that's part yeah. of the story there. Um, and so to the medieval world we were just talking about. So this is a classic example. It's um, Maleficent II. Um, and I was really pleased to be um, asked to do this film because the designer wanted to do a brightly coloured version of the medieval world that mm. was very much referencing um, the world of Disney. And I absolutely love early Disney. I love the, yeah. the Sleeping Beauty from 1959. Um, so obviously you look you're looking at the original Sleeping Beauty cartoon, but because I have to make uh, like real world examples, my approach was, right, I'm going to go into medieval art, kind of late Gothic, um, maybe kind of 14th, 15th, 15th century. And I'm going to try and find examples of, of Disney. And on, on the right hand side here, you can see just a couple of my references. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's interesting to see that they do exist. Um, you know, this image here, which is from 1470, you know, it could be from an animation. It's it's so stylized. And yeah, so yeah. you're looking for overlaps there that are going to kind of, um, you know, tick boxes in both worlds, if you like. This is um, Michelle Pfeiffer in front of one of my tapestries. So this would be a example of a deep background prop. You're never going to see it up close. She's about four meters away from it. Um, and it's complementing the drama. She's here, um, like practicing her crossbow shot. And so what we've got in the background is, um, I did about 12 of them, a tapestry where um, a mythical creature is having its horn removed and some of the others were like mythical creatures being killed. That was the narrative that she was waging war on the mythical world. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna use color, like obviously you've got the red, <laughs> that's really obvious. And you've got the um, the unicorn with its horn snapped, and then I used for this in this case quite a graphic style of tapestry that was a bit earlier um, yeah. than the 15th century because I knew it was deep background and if it was going to register in any way, it needed to be, um, you know, quite graphic and obvious. Yeah, and it reads. Um, I mean, I think that it for people it also reads so right because we most people that have seen medieval art, have seen the the unicorn tapestries that, you know, that exist, that some, I think some are in New York and then some mm -hmm. are. Yeah, I looked at those, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 
It's interesting because I read about the original animators at Disney and they all went to look at those tapestries. Oh, yeah. So, so they based the animation on the tapestries. And then I was here designing tapestries that were referenced in the animation. So there's a kind of a nice kind of circular connection there. Um, but yeah, the other thing to consider is the costume. You know, she's there in a white dress. So if I'd done a light tapestry, it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So I have to do something where, you know, it's going to complement what she's wearing. Um, this is a set from Maleficent 2. This is um, with studio lights on. So this is how you'll never see it in the film, but I'm, I'm yeah. showing it you like this so you can see all the details. So basically my department would we were responsible for this huge carpet, 40 foot uh, kind of Persian style heraldic carpet. We were doing flags, we were doing banners, we were doing chair backs, mm. um, plates, all sorts. It was like a banqueting sequence. So we would um, have all these elements made bespoke um, for the set. Um, and this is a close up of the carpet. So, um, you know, a car, so if something's on the floor, it's not just deep background. It's not even on the same plane as your camera, really. Right. The camera's going this way and the, the carpet's here. So yeah. a lot of people will just say, you know, it doesn't matter. Just, you know, do something, do something quick and easy. Um, but I really wanted to draw this as a bit of a challenge. So I drew this in a computer. We printed it on onto velvet. Um, and I think at this point, you're really creating something for the crew and the actors. Mm -hmm. It's like I said, it's it's not really going to register on screen, but what what's lovely is if actors and crew come onto a set and they see the amount of effort that different departments have put in, you know, to different things, and um, you know, it's it's good for the project mm. if if people inv invest time and detail. I think. Um, so the idea is that you, the animals are all being caught, like they're all changed. Yeah, up. yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. So yeah. Sorry. This um. I used a heraldic language because we, we're in a kind of public space and we wanted we wanted to make the point that, you know, in the narrative, the queen is kind of capturing the mythical creatures. Maleficent comes in and it's supposed to be a quite a hostile environment. So um, I was depicting these animals, you know, with chains, which, again, is is kind of we've, we've seen all this in, in heraldry. So again, you kind of select from heraldry the thing that suits your story. Mm. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll zoom in on it if I can. You can just see. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like how many, how many little pieces there. Um, so. And this is this is the scene with that carpet. So you can see really how much is registering. Not not much. Yeah. Um, you know, the other element of what we do is you can make something and then the lighting department come along and, you know, completely change the way that something looks. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's I still really enjoy doing it. And it was it was a great thing to draw. Yeah. Like you said, the 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 energy and the the basic the basic effort reads, you know, it you can you can feel the richness of the of the texture and the space. So it, it definitely adds. Hmm. It's the picture of me with another tapestry from that film. So we're in a um, in a bedroom space, so it's more intimate. It's you. I went for a bit of a softer language because I knew, um, you know, like I said, it's more private. It's more likely that the actors may be closer. Um, and you can see that that's it hung on the wall. It's obviously supposed to be like a heavyweight tapestry, but you can see from that shot that it's just a piece of white fabric with a digital print. Yeah. So um, what I have to do in this case is actually draw, I have to put everything into the artwork because the technology of how it's produced is not going to give me anything. Mm. Um, and one of the most important things that I've learned doing this kind of work is how much technology um defines art um I think when I was like a fine artist I used to think that the artist was everything and you know you could just make whatever you wanted but things like tapestries um are so driven by the technology so when I was drawing this I had to consider where to look into you know what what were the limitations of the dyes for example you know 
if, if you think about the red tapestry I showed you before that's earlier, mm. it's probably because they had like more basic looms, they had like thicker wool, you know, so the actual um, the actual language was had to be kind of simpler and more graphic. And then as you got to like the late 15th century, things were more sophisticated. Um, and so so you got like finer, finer details, finer illustration, but they still only had like, you know, X amount of colors available. And the challenge for someone like me who's working on a computer is, again, just having infinite colors. You know, it's a problem. You have you have to limit yourself in order to make something that feels authentic. Um, so, you know, sometimes when I've designed things, I'm like, it's not quite right. It's probably because I'm not sticking to the rules of, of, of the limitation of that technology. Mm -hmm. Um and so in this, you had to design even, I mean, you had to design it so that it looked like it was woven, I imagine. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, I mean, I can show you some details of it. So the way that it's drawn is basically in tiny lines. Yeah, okay. Um. So you couldn't draw like solid things. I mean, probably having, this is probably the best, yeah, thing, but good. you can you can see the way of actually drawn in the woven lines in there. Um. And yeah, that again with 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 digital printing, it's something you have to do. Um, this is a picture of it when it was installed in the set, wow. um, which again, it doesn't look like this in the film. But um, and this that's car I did that carpet as well. So you know, big consideration with this is where does the bed go? Where mm. where is this um, you know curtain going? You've got to make the images fit around the architecture. That's mm. very important. Um, so, but still you have the animals kind of the animals with their, uh, yeah, yeah, up, you know, yeah. So it's a of. similar theme. Yeah. It's a similar theme to the one downstairs. Oh, and just to say these trees here, they were kind of inspired by the original, um, 1959 animation. Mm -hmm. Um, and here it is in the film. So you can see, uh, Aurora and the queen. And so the queen's embracing her, but it's not genuine. Um, and then you've got, you know, this is her dress is pink. And then I've got a pink rose in the background because her name is Briar Rose. Mm -hmm. And then you've obviously got this kind of chained, um, swan here. Yeah. Um, which is obviously like a, a kind of reflection of the narrative. Um, and that's, I mean, I think that for people, it's important to see in how subtle it is, right? Because it, and it won't read consciously for people, but, you know, when you add up all these very subtle connections in a, in a story, that's when people get a kind of magical sense of coherence, even though they're not able to, and that's what, you know, like some of the symbolism that I point out, even like in Bible stories or in myth or whatever, uh, you know, the 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 explicit links I point out are perceived by people implicitly. People can perceive coherence. They can perceive they can perceive analogical coherence, even though they can't explicate it. They just yeah. know that the story is good and they remember it, but they can't. Yeah. So, so like pointing it out is fun for, and it's, it's wonderful because it helps people see how these things are built. But uh, someone would watch the movie and get a sense of coherence without if you pointed it out, like you said, oh, look at the same color of a dress and the rose and then the, the swan in the background. Oh, yeah. OK, that makes sense. Uh, but they don't even need to see it for it to work. You're absolutely right. And, and whenever I meet people who've seen films I've worked on, I never want them to have noticed my work because <laughs> because if they've noticed it, probably it's probably a bad thing. You know, the, what you want is just for people to come out and say, I really enjoyed the movie. You know, that's what you want. And you don't want them to say, oh, I like that tapestry in scene three. Because, uh, yeah. again, it really shouldn't be detracting from the actors, for starters. And secondly, you don't want that symbolism to be, you know, too overt because, you know, it's too much. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you like things kind of being being hidden. I'm, I'm, it's nice to, to hear you say that you think they're subtle because I always worry, like, oh, is that too much? But like you say, I think most people watching it probably wouldn't notice. No, but um, I definitely know. I mean, these are the things that I notice. But I, I think most artists would have more sensibility to to seeing that. Like I said, the work you did in Hellboy Two, I just remember because it was, it seemed to me so rare that that this type of detail was included in movies that it just really stood out for me. Um, and the same, I remember watching the Bond film, and it's. And and the same, just feeling like it was so well done. I mean, like everything was so 
beautiful, not beautiful, not beautiful in the sense of attractive, but beautiful in the sense of appropriate, like all the scenes that were appropriate. Yeah, I think I think um, what you're saying is usually due to having a really good director, because uh, there's so many of us involved in the process. If you have a director like Guillermo or Sam Mendes who really know what they're doing, they can really lead everyone in one direction. Um, and every, if everyone knows what they're doing, it's great. Um, some some films I've worked on haven't had that leadership, and at that point, everyone's guessing, and it can be. You can imagine the results. Um, yeah. Well, we've all seen, like we've all, seen, you know, and I hate to use specific examples, but I will. Uh, you know, th this recent series, the this season, the series, what it's called, the Chosen, the Jesus series. You know, okay, it's, it's like it. You can see that there's no, there's no capacity to create coherent visual spaces right it's like okay we need something that looks old we need something that looks oriental like so we just kind of put things in there and, I, and so some of it is budget i totally understand and i sympathize with that uh but it affects your perception of the story when you 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 know when you you you're watching and there's no there's no sense of coherence and then compare that to for example watching dune where it, it's not as if there's massive amounts of story in Dune, right? It's it's like, it's actually a pretty slow film, but you're just so mesmerized by the visual coherence of the yeah. story and the attention to detail that it just, it traps you, right? You just keep watching because it's so, yeah. it's so powerfully yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting you say that because um, I've, I've come to the end of my film work now and I just wanted to chat to you about something, which is kind of what, how can we apply these, these ideas in, in the wider world. And I've thought about them a lot in terms of churches and how churches are designed. But because of my background, whenever I go into a church and I go into quite a lot here in England, um, I'm super sensitive to, to the way things are designed um, and, you know, ornament patterns um, that, you know, they're all transmitting information basically to me. Mm. Um, and, I've recently started going to a new um, Romanian Orthodox mission church, and I wanted to talk to you about it because they're, they're, they're a new mission. Their circumstances are actually quite compromised. They're hiring a church from the Anglicans. It's, it's a big kind of 12th century Norman church on a hill, usual kind of setting in an English village. Um, and they're kind of coming in a few days a week and setting up that, that you know this this orthodox mission but the way that they are they direct attention is absolutely masterful and i and i i go in and watch it and a lot of the liturgy is in romanian but it doesn't matter because what they're doing visually is so captivating and they they, they basically do it with color and light and for me it's just an example that we can all learn from of you actually don't need the Hollywood budgets or, you know, the huge resources because they don't actually have very much. But, but with what they've got, they're just using it really cleverly. Um, and I think I'm happy to hear that, by the way, because <laughs> there are so many churches that don't do that, especially in America. And I have to say, uh, made closer to me than I wish, where there's a there's a desire to to go over the top because like almost to overcompensate for the lack of a good space. And so it's like, you know, buying ornaments at Home Depot and gluing them on plywood and then spray painting it with gold paint. Uh, and you think, man, like you just do something simple. It would be so yeah. much better, right? Yeah, so, so what I see with this particular church, which is so impressive is they're investing in the things that the congregation are witnessing close up. You know, so it's like the, um, you know, the treasure binding of the gospel. They've got the icons, obviously, and the chalice, you know, and then they've got the candelabras and pretty much that's it. Or, you know, they're probably going to be flowers and their icons are just on a couple of easels, but they've draped them in some beautiful fabric. Um, and, I, and again, I just love that because it's economy and it's focus and it's really putting the resources where they should be and kind of traveling around in England and going to churches in other denominations, what I see is just, you know, in some ways they have more resources, but there isn't the same focus, you know, it might all be fundraising for the, the vestry roof or something, which I, I know these practical problems exist and we need to, we need to address them, but also it's like, 
but where is the priority? Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, I really wanted to, if anyone's listening, appeal to people, you know, please, please engage artists and designers um, in your church um, because d- design is happening whether you like it or not. You know, I think you've talked about this, Jonathan, but, you know, you can't avoid design. It's going to work on your congregation anyway. So use it consciously. And it doesn't matter you know, whatever, whatever your expression of Christianity is, it can be done on different levels, Mm. but, but but you have to take care of it. You know, it's like the skyfall stuff, you know, it look, it's simple, but it still needs thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can see the, you know, in terms of, in terms of attention and design, the, it's interesting to, to think about how, especially as many churches move towards entertainment mode, you know, how the type of design they use ends up reflecting that. And it's almost accidental. They don't necessarily realize what's going on. They just want to make something interesting. But the type of attention that you give to a concert and the type of attention you give to God is not the same attention. And so the the danger, like the danger of going bling, right, and having light shows and smoke and all that stuff, is that there is a type of attention, the the type that you talk about, which is like a simple candle on a table and a, you know, a, let's say just, just a bit of light coming in from a high window that, that has a transforming effect that is that subtle, but, but has more to do with the type of transformation we need to, to do in our, in ourselves, like the type of attention and transformation we need to To, to have then you know being overwhelmed by a, on a massive sound system and and uh, and you know electric guitars absolutely yeah right um Jim, all right so now we're going to talk about all right and so this is this is this is very this is like a big deal to me because um you know i the symbolic world branding, as some of you know, I mean, some people, some people were very attached to it, but it was, it was done very rapidly and with a bunch of different people and, and kind of chaotically in some ways. And so, although I did like the image of Adam and Eve, uh, there was something about it, which was too much. It was, it was too much detail and everything. So I've been thinking about the desire to, i had been having the desire to create something more simple, more encompassing in terms of, um, you know, it's weird. Like even this image, the symbolic world, you know, I had these t-shirts printed. I gave the t-shirt to one of my kids and they're like, well, I'm not going to wear that dad. There's like naked people on the, on the image. And I thought, wait, oh yeah, that's true. I didn't even realize just how there's, there's a little too much in this. And so Heather contacted me and said, you know, she liked the channel and that she, if I, if I would like, she would help me to, to kind of redesign some things. And so I was, I was super excited because I saw her work. And so, so we're going to take you kind of through what our thinking was and what we wanted to do. So, all right, you can, you can, you can go now, Heather. This is, this is exciting to me. Okay. Um, right. So the first thing to say is there was already a logo, which is really important because, um, again, there's an expectation from your audience about what the symbolic world is. Like whatever you say about that logo, it was established. And so in very basic terms, I had to think about like, what is the atmosphere of the channel? And from what I remember about your intros, it was like a black world. There was a kind of glittering gold thing. Um, And it was, there was quite a lot of dimension. You know, you'd done some quite cinematic stuff. So, you know, the danger is if I came along with my ideas of like what I think you should do and design something like slick vector graphics, like your audience basically switches on the day that it launches and they're like, where are we? You know, so, so so you have to honor in the same way, you know, with Mary Poppins or whatever, you have to honor what what is it kind of in the hearts and minds of your audience already and what are they used to? And so so you're evolving something. You're not kind of starting from scratch. You, you're going, here's some elements that work. Let's keep hold of them and let's kind of build on them. So if I look at this logo here, actually, I really liked it. Um, but the, the main problem looking at that technically for me is that all of the kind of identity and detail was in the back image and the lettering. Um, yeah, I, d- I don't know. I don't know what, how you did that. But I but didn't do that. That was the people who made my website who just like just 
put that yeah, up. Yeah, okay. So so there hadn't been that much consideration. Not much consideration left. at all. <laughs> and you know, that's your title, and it's a really <laughs> brilliant title, the symbolic world. So it's like, okay, so we really need to do something with the lettering. Um, and sort out the hierarchy, because again, problem is you've got thing in the forefront with no information, really. It's a strange kind of 1980s white typeface. And then the thing at the back has all the identity. So we need to flip those around. Um, <clears throat> so it's just working better. Um, so you came to me with this brief of uh, Norman Sicily and the Paradexion tree. So maybe I we can tell people a little bit. That I just want to maybe tell people about the Paradexion tree and why what yeah, I yeah. wanted to do with that, because I know some people are looking at the new logo and wondering like what's going on with the new logo. So right. the, the Peridexian tree is a medieval legend about a tree that exists in the East. It's a tree in India or somewhere mysteriously in the East. And this tree is special because under the tree, there's a dragon that, that just kind of hangs out under the tree. And then there are doves that land in the branches of this tree. Um, and while the doves are in the uh, shadow of the tree, then the dragon won't harm them. You could even say that in some ways the dragon protects them because the dragon is scaring off any other predator for the tree. But as soon as the, as the dove leaves the, the shadow of the tree, then the dragon will eat the bird. And so to me, this was such a powerful image of symbolism. It contained heaven and earth, it contained this heavenly influence that comes down on the structure of, of a pattern tree. And then the monster at the, at the bottom that is both a gargoyle, but also the monster that will devour the, the pattern if you're not careful and you, and you let these higher influences leave the shadow of the pattern. And so it just seemed like a beautiful, simple cosmic image that had a lot of visual potential to it as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a complex thing, I think, um... You know, it, it was challenging in lots of respects because you have quite a long title. And what you'll usually see in brands is if you have a long title, you have a very simple image mm. or you'll have a very sh a, a complex image and a short title. So I, I, there was a lot to deal with here. And it's one of the things that um, I struggled with initially. But they, so Norman Sicily was amazing when you showed me that. It was kind of mosaics that I was aware of and I'd, I'd really admired, but I, I hadn't looked into it deeply. So I had the opportunity to do that, you know, st studied all those amazing mosaics and knew there was like a lot of visual potential in those. And these are like some of the first sketches that I did. Um, and looking back now, they're like really overcomplicated. And the main reason for that is that I was just too close to the reference what happens quite often with historic references is that you kind of fall a bit in love with it and, and then you're too close to it. Um, yeah. And also I had had a few iterations made even before we started working where there was a logo like this that contained all the elements in it. And, you know, it, it looks good as like a, you know, like as a tapestry or as, a, you know, the, Andrew Gould looked at some of these and said, oh, it looks like a, like a forged gate, you know, something like that, but not yeah. a logo. Uh, yeah, exactly that. So it, they, they become almost decorative and they would work as decorative pieces, but there's there's too much information. So, again, the challenge was to really condense down. And, and like I said, I had like a tree to deal with. I had dragons to deal with and the doves. So there's a lot of elements. Um, so we went through a few rounds and I was like, still, it's still too much. And I think then you sort of said, right, we need to sort of go back to basics and get into the world of the logo. And here were some kind of early um, attempts at that to really kind of um, just condense down, like what could a tree be? What is the minimal we could show that could represent a tree? And what, it, you know, in this case, it's like, you know, there's three strands and then I've made the dragon just a head, yeah. you know, and then we've kept the doves. Um, yeah. And then we had the idea of maybe if the doves, if we show the doves landing on the actual dragon, then that sense of protection and danger could be included into the, into yeah. one image. And at first, even without the tree, we're like, maybe we just have to ditch the tree because it's too much. Yeah. Yeah. I think we were having those conversations where we going through like, well, how, how much can we get away with saying and not saying, I think. Mm. Um, but at this point, I think we use, you, the dragon seemed to be the most important thing and the, the best um, emblem in terms of a kind of strong logo that was that was memorable. 
So I think you, I think this one was the one that was closest. But at this point, I'm I'm still using like off the shelf type typefaces, mm. and I knew that I wasn't going to get away with that because um, you know there literally isn't anything from uh, Norman Sicily in terms of a typeface. <laughs> So, There's no Norman Sicily typeface. What are designers thinking? It really doesn't exist, like nothing even close. We need more so, of it. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I, was, I, I got to this stage. And I was like, right, do you know what? I'm just going to park the dragon for a bit, look at the lettering, and then I'm going to come back once I'm, I'm aware of what's going to happen with that. So in terms of lettering, I looked at probably like 30 or something different mosaics from across you know Byzantine architecture looked at um San Marco um looked at Ravenna places like that and really what you're looking at when you when you when you look at this kind of thing you're trying to find averages so you're like you know you look at all the s's and go what what's the kind of tendency towards how they how they would express an s for example um the other thing to say is when you're drawing a typeface you um you you want it you want it to have some of the idiosyncrasies of that historic typeface, but not too much because it it has to work in the modern world. So, for example, you know some of some of these letters, you would, I would draw it accurately, and then and then I would kind of iron it out, so to speak, to make it more kind of commercial in feel. Um, you're also looking for opportunities to kind of inject um, other other kind of meanings, and so with the O. I was aware that this shape here, you know, is is in the icon of the Transfiguration, mm. and this the side wound of Christ. It seems to be a very significant shape in Christian art. I'm sure you know much more yeah. about it than I do. So that that kind of gave me um, the idea of how I wanted to do the O's. Mm. Um, and this is the this was the first drawing in black of um, the typeface. Uh, and I once I'd done this, I felt pretty happy that I had lettering that that was from that world um but like i said it's always a balance between like the historic and then also the commercial or the you know the modern um so i then started looking to you know turn it into more of a brand and i just i don't know how it happened just this idea one day i just thought what if one of the doves kind of was landing on the eye and then i had the idea of you having a little like tree like ligature on the eye and I was looking at it, I was thinking, you know, this now has kind of the imagery of the arc, which I think is kind of appropriate for what Jonathan's doing. So that kind of fitted as well. Um, yeah, it's the arc, but it's it's also, it's, it is it is the dove carrying the branch, carrying the pattern. It's, it's yeah. powerful, but then it's also referencing back to the peridexian tree in a subtle way, right? It's not, yeah. it's not as explicit, but it's, it has, it has the, the bird landing on the tree as well. Yeah. So I was hoping that it, that it, it answered the Peridexian tree brief, but also it kind of had wider associations for people. Cause I, I don't think, you know, you can look at a dove without thinking of the flood narrative. I mean, it's. Of course. It's I'm sure most there. people wouldn't, wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't even think of that when they saw it, but it's there. <laughs> yeah. Um, And then I started looking at the rendering. So obviously wanted to go back to the kind of the beautiful real uh, gold mosaics um, that I'd looked at in the reference. And um, and the other reason I, I went for it is because um, I knew that you probably want something a bit dimensional. Like we, we talked about in the beginning that, you know, you've done things that are, that are quite cinematic. Mm -hmm. And I know your channel's kind of famous for movie interpretation so I was like what what if I rendered it like you know a movie title I've worked on a lot of films that have that like metal type you know yeah, yeah. very big at the moment so I thought yeah I thought it kind of worked it again it was like historical but it also um had a bit of kind of pop culture about it as well <clears throat> yeah um and then to the dragon so this was my final drawing of the dragon um and then adding the little branch inside the the circle too, because we kept struggling at how we're going to include the tree. And then you had this idea of just like if we just had this little branch, and all of a sudden yeah. the tree comes in without it being too explicitly referenced. Yeah, I actually saw it on a Roman mosaic. Mm. They had they had this little thing coming in, and and I was like, okay, that's how we do that. So again, it's just gesturing, isn't it, rather than having to explain the whole thing. Um, so yeah, this this is the final dragon, and 
Um, I was aware that in terms, this is my kind of concept for the website. I was aware in the website, you know, we've got these two elements that I was really happy that the dragon is working on its own as a symbol that, that you'd be able to use. But in terms of the website, we might want to have two elements together. So again, you're thinking about hierarchy, you've got the title and then the dragon becomes a watermark. So, you know, as for you as my client, I'm trying to give you as many different opportunities because you've got many, many kind of applications. You might be doing T-shirts, you know, and so you're giving people a kind of set of assets that they mm -hmm. can then adapt. So I felt like, you know, that that was going to um, kind of serve those purposes. Um, and yeah, so this is the actual website, which is now live and looking yeah. great. I'm so pleased because it, it looks exactly like um like what you design. had thought of. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's perfect. I think that it does have that. It does have a kind of cinematic feel to it. And uh, there's also a certain sobriety and simplicity, even though the, the language like the letters are, 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 you know, are flickering and golden. The basic aesthetics of the website is simple. And the same with the. Uh, like you're showing the uh, the thumbnails for the videos too. Uh, Heather kind of gave us a direction for the thumbnails, you know, to to have simple images with with simple text, and then have the dragon inside. And I think that the, the right that right mixture of kind of simplicity with the the very animated logo is perfect for what we're doing. Yeah. So I'm now everybody it. knows the mystery of the of the new symbolic world logo. And so I mean, I think what's great about this is to is to see how, you know, in some ways, like somebody would look at the logo now and have no idea that it's based on a Peridexian tree, but it, but in some ways it doesn't matter because the imagery is there and the symbolism is there in the title and in the, in the, uh, it's its own thing, right? It doesn't have to be explicitly that, but it alludes and it, it refers to, to these types of images in a way that makes the meaning implicit in the image. So, it's like that's also kind of how symbolism works. Sometimes we think that you have to make references explicit, even in a story or in a movie, or or sometimes it's good to do that, but sometimes you don't have to. You can just have them as as being very implicit analogies that don't have to be made to, to try to make yourself look smart by making them explicit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of things that are suggestive. Um, you know, and I think, yeah, it's 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 ended up being really interesting i mean one thing i forgot to say about the dragon is um the way that i designed it i really wanted it to be like a real hybrid creature you know it's like the 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 wing is feathered you know it's not like a, a standard dragon wing but one of the challenges was i looked into um uh the norman sicily and you can't really find any dragons in that world. Yeah. They're they're much more like griffins because that world was looking much more towards Islamic art and the East and, and those influences. And we looked at like Mesopotamian dra dragons and things like that. So it was always going to be a hybrid dragon. Um, and so, yeah, the, I had the feathered wing and then, you know, the tail is almost like a sea serpent. So there was it, it's almost like kind of three creatures stuck together, um, yeah. which... For Which is it's perfect. Oh, right. I mean, it's it, it's more like because the 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 dragon, and I think that's one of the things we were butting up against is that the dragon in Western thinking is so tired in some ways. Like in fan, in fantasy, it has become so tired that you know proposing more of a a kind of griffin dragon uh, is still the same idea as the dragon. It's the same thing, uh, but it has a it has a freshness to it that that makes you makes you notice it differently than if it was, if it looked, if it would, if we'd use the medieval dragon, then it would have been, it would have been like Dungeons and Dragons. It would have been all these images of Game of Thrones and all these types of yeah. things would have been rising up to people's minds. And that's not what we wanted. So. Yeah. Cause I think uh, modern day medieval films are showing dragons in a particular way that we're all used to, as you described, like leathery wings, may maybe their scales, but if you look at the um, dragons in manuscripts, they're really weird. You know, yeah. some of them have only got two legs like this one. And then it so I wanted to go back to the really weird dragons, you know, the really, like you say, hybrid, hybrid dragons um, and, and try and use that. Because if you don't have an, a direct reference, you really have to kind of pull from different sources. Um, so, yeah, I hope it's kind of uh, unusual in that way. Yeah. 
So, so Heather, thank you so much. And I want to make the, if everybody, most people probably know that are watching this, but uh, some those who don't know yet, Heather and I have been working on other projects. Uh, we're going to publish a version of Snow White that she illustrated completely and that I wrote and that I am, it's the thing that I'm the most excited about that I'm doing right now. It's really amazing. Uh, Heather just finished up all the illustrations. They're, they're, they're beautiful and powerful and, and have all this rich complexity in terms of suggesting and symbolism. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to introducing that to you. We're going to have another conversation in a few weeks that are going to be talking about Snow White and the choices that we made, both in terms of story and in terms of illustration. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to introducing all that and, and yeah, and, and uh, continuing to work with Heather. So Heather, thanks for your time and thanks for all your creative energy. You're very welcome. Thank you.